My name is Monk Rowe, and we're at the other side in Utica, New York, talking with Reggie Watkins. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a question I usually save, but when you were in, let's say, junior high school, were you having a debate with yourself and or your parents about what am I going to be when I grow up? I, I was having a debate with myself because I, I spent, you know, band was important to me at developmentally, you know, as it is for a lot of um, students, musicians coming up through school. And I was in, um, I was in junior high and I was, a, I, was, I was going through a little bit of a misbehavior phase as well because I remember the, myself and my, my friend sitting next to me would get sent to the hallway. That was the punishment in junior high, you get sent to the hallway. But at the same time, they needed us because we were the two tuba players, you know, so. Um, and, and, uh, and as a junior high student, I started getting uh, made aware of jazz, you know. How so? Um, basic improvisation from the band director. You know, they would maybe play some things, talk about some things, and then give us the, um, some kind of basic concepts to, impro to learn how to improvise. And I remember going to my friend Matt's house, he was a saxophone player, and, uh, and doing some things, you know, just trying to, he had, he had play-alongs, and, and so we, we were, you know, we were um, checking out the play-alongs, and in band and you know I didn't really see myself as a musician actually so we, and at that school when you left ninth grade that was you graduated junior high in ninth grade so while you're getting ready to graduate you're signing up for your high school classes and I left band completely out I decided I wasn't going to be involved in it any longer you know and uh, it was the last couple of days of school and um, I guess that, that set off an alarm. I got called to the principal's office. I didn't do anything. And so I'm wondering what I did. I go to the principal's office. He says, um, so you didn't sign up for band? I said, no, I'm, I'm not interested. I'm good. He said, well, I really think you should. They need you. And, um, you know, I think I was showing a little bit of promise in terms of, you know, you know, become a criminal or a musician or somewhere in between. But uh, no, so he, he brought me in there specifically, just him and I, to say, look, you're going to have this summer. Why don't you do band? Um, and I said, and I said, okay. And it was a lie. You know, I thought, I'm, I'm not going to go. So be early August, high school band camp commences. And I don't, I don't show up for band camp. Two or three days later, I get a call from the band director, and he basically recruits me. You know, they and you know, I don't play tuba anymore, and that was part of the reason I was trying to get away from tuba. But I had gone, I had sh I'd shown, some, shown some promise, went to all state band, was um, uh, help. You know, I, I was a I was a needed element to the. They needed me there. You know, they need tuba players and they need good musicians. You know, but I just didn't see myself as a musician. Did they have a marching band? They did have a marching band. Yeah. So the marching band started early August, right. my sophomore year, and they were like, "We need to get this. We need to get this guy involved." You know, sousaphone. Sousaphone. Yeah. That's right. That's right. I never envied the sousaphone players. <laughs> I remember watching the band's rears. My daughter was in the, both of them in a marching band and yeah. carrying that thing around. Yeah. But interestingly enough, in this spot a couple months ago, we had uh, Joseph Daly. Mm, yeah. And he was wailing on the tuba. Joseph Daly, yeah, 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 I'm a fan. <laughs> well, there must have been some inspiration then from that point on. Well, it was good that they brought me into high school. It's nice to have something that you feel like you belong to, even before classes started. I had a sense of belonging to the band, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that first year of marching band was really exciting. Um, and then it turned out that all my friends were trombone players. So I wanted to be in the trombone section. 
And there was kind of a, you know, a light bulb moment where as a sophomore, they had the seniors perform for us. Like they brought in all the music kids and they had the, the high school jazz, the senior jazz ensemble perform for us. And that was that moment. And, and, and I never forget the guy's name was Todd. He, he played lead trombone, but he played valve trombone. And, um, and everything came together. Like I thought, okay, I already know how to play tuba. I know I can play that valve trombone. This can get me out of the tuba section into the trombone section. Um, and at the same time, I, I, right at that moment, I fell in love with the music. And so from that time up until today, I've been listening to jazz every single day of my life. You know? Do you recall what, what arrangements, what was the style that? You know, they did a lot of, um, the band director and, and the repertoire there was usually stuff like Count Basie, you know, repertoire, kind of mm -hmm. standardized high school jazz repertoire, repertoire, maybe a Thad Jones thing would sneak in, but, but mostly Basie, kind of mm -hmm. um, that kind of stuff. Um, and that moment, the, what, the, other, the other component of that experience at that moment was he was improvising, he was taking a solo. And it just had meaning to me, you know? And then ever since then, everything I do, and I'm, I mean, I'm an ensemble player as well, but my, my kind of my motivation, my fuel for practicing is to, to, so that I can exist in the landscape of improvisation, you know? Um, but um, yeah, so that moment, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget that, that picture there of being standing there with all these other students and just having that, that's what I'm going to do, you know? So, and I never questioned it after that. Were, were you more inclined to take risks than other musicians in the band as far as improvisation? I, I guess what I mean by that, some, a lot of students are really afraid of mistakes mm. or what they perceive as mistakes. Mm -hmm. And when they hit one, it's like, they stop and make a face or whatever. I wonder if that was not an issue. That wasn't an issue for me. And again, I had that background in, in uh, junior high of having the chance to get a, you know, a, an introduction to improvisation mm -hmm. and a B flat blues scale, et cetera. You know? So I always enjoyed those broad concepts of a major scale, a B flat, a blues scale, you know, four, four time. Like those, that to me was enough comfort to say, oh, just go ahead and play, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, and then you learn things as you go along, just larger concepts in music, right. you know. Because that little bit of information is a lot of comfort. Yeah. I think I was, when you talk about playing free, that means you have so many choices that sometimes you're stymied. There's too, too many choices. Yeah, yeah. Free to me means play like yourself. You know, um, I'm kind of like a music, a lot of us musicians, as I'm sure you're the same, we love lots of music. We have a wide palette. We listen to things. I get a big kick out of music, that, just all different kinds of music in the world. But, um, you know, when you're doing something, when they say free, that means you have license to do whatever you want. So I think your real, your real tendencies come out when, when you're in the mindset of playing free, you know, as opposed to being with, um, maybe you'll find yourself in a group of musicians that are very specific in their tastes, okay? So what they have like what they call trad bands right. in New York City, in New Orleans. And I've been to trad sessions in New York City and you go in and everybody's, it's almost like, it's almost like a, uh, like a, you know, it's like you're walking to a room full of anachronisms, you know, and there's everybody in their old hairstyle with the, you know, they've got just the, the, the whole thing, the whole 
ball of wax. Like a dress. Twilight Zone moment. Like it really true. is. Yeah. It really is. I said, wow, they're committed. And then all the musicians are playing, sounding beautiful. No bebop in the language. No, you know, no R&B into the language. Um, and I really admired that and, and realized that's specific. And the same thing, if you go to Smalls in New York, at times, depending who's there, but it's, you know, some of these places are known as bebop factories. And there are people that are very specific in their approach. So for me and for a lot of musicians, I think that the wide range of influences um, prevents us from being purists. And when you put things on your website about what it is you do, mm -hmm. you try to make it clear that you're a man with many influences. Do I? I think you do. You I mean, think I do? If you list, if, if, if you, when you listed some of the people you've played with, mm -hmm. um, mm. to me it means that you're open to other things. I am. As and well as the practical idea of taking a gig. Yes. I need a gig. Absolutely. I play with blood, sweat, and tears. I may yes. have loved that music, and maybe I didn't, but... There is there is a balancing act that goes on as a professional musician, depending on your opportunities and your interests. There's some opportunities I've had which I've had to let go because I just, I couldn't sign off. You, you know, I don't see a place for me in country music. And I, I had an opportunity to play with a really big really big country act and I didn't I couldn't do it I just I you know I just thought okay this is crossing the line and they're great and and but you know so you just make these decisions on a day day to day basis but I learned a lot about music and a lot about jazz from pop music the good kind you know and it occurred to me at a certain point that taking a simple idea and giving it lots of love and care, you know, rather than just trying to play as much as you can and play hard. You never hear that expression, play hard, play hard. There's a, there's a validity to that, but, you know, I, I noticed like my old boss, Jason Mraz, he's a songwriter, he's a guitar player. Not in the sense of West Montgomery, but in the sense of a songwriter accompanying himself. But just those, that, that attention to simple ideas and, you know, um, it means a lot. It means a lot when it comes to getting your point across to an audience. You know, so in improvisation, I try to remember that. You know, I try to be myself. I try to not be a Bill Watrous, which I could never be. I try to not be somebody, you know, it's just do, you know, my idea is that you take something simple and you nurture it. And if it then grows all these leaves, um, so to speak, then that's fine. But at least it's, the, the start of it is, is, um, is solid and pure and, and uh, concise. I like that, well said. Thank you. Um, there's a, a thing I often read, uh, people describing what improvisers are doing. And it sort of goes, they're playing what they feel or they're playing the way they feel. And I'm wondering if how you're feeling, the emotion of that particular day, whatever, affects the way you play. Yes and no. Because as professionals and as like people making a living, you have to block out some of that so that you can concentrate, focus on your audience. You know, um, if you can bring emotion, genuine feelings or emotion to the stage, it's gonna happen in the moment, you know, um, for me. Um, but, you know, if you're, in a way, the way I, I don't block the audience out, but I don't, I, 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 I don't know how to explain it, but it's like focusing on the task at hand. You know, um, and I want to do it for the music. I want to do it for the people in front of us, you know, but and then so to carry, you know, th th anything that would come onto this stage that's an emotional thing or part of my life 
would just be um, those things happen naturally, yeah. you know. Okay. You know, if if it, you know, if you have some life defining um, event that that goes on, well, sure, that's really gonna that's really gonna do it. But just in day to day, we're used to like being tired and you know being away from our families and everything, and then we we come to the music, and then the music is its own reward. So then it's time than to enjoy and be a part of the music, you know? Yeah. Some people like, like to hear angst. Yes. In, in jazz. Yeah. Um, I just finished a book about the making of Kind of Blue. Mm -hmm. And this author sort of said a number of times that Cannonball didn't really fit all that well in some of the stuff because he was too ebullient. He couldn't suppress his his joy in his playing, and I felt like saying, "And this is a bad thing." Well, at a time when you know uh, the Mingus, Ornette Coleman, and all these things are going on, and yeah, that's like the happy opposite of the political statements. You know, right. I guess the same could be said for Dizzy in a way. It's just yeah. having so much fun on right. stage. Yeah, it goes back to you talking about trad jazz. Yeah. You know, I think that it it doesn't rate that high in jazz history or in academia because it's too darn happy. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound like serious enough for to study. Right. Uh, but and that's debatable, you know. And you mentioned to me before Branford Marsalis. I went to a Branford Marsalis um, lecture a few weeks ago at the University of Pittsburgh, and. And uh, it was interesting, he pointed out that he has, you know, a student that wants to play like John Coltrane and is just listening only to John Coltrane. And he said, how do you think he got to play that way? Do you think he sat and listened to albums of his future self and transcribed it? He said, you got to listen to the people that came. Who was John Coltrane listening to is the question. You want to learn to play like Trey. So, you know, he's one of the people that's a firm believer in you have to have those roots before, you know, before you move forward into more modern things. Um, and there's a lot of different feelings on that, you know. I remember being struck when I was a very young man, had an incredible opportunity to play um, and back up Oliver Lake. And Oliver Lake, you know, we went to get the set list together, and I had no business being on stage with Oliver Lake, but I was thrilled. Um, and uh, and we, were, we were tasked to put together a set list. And he doesn't, he said this, he said he didn't know any standards. He didn't know American Songbook. He didn't know things like um, just things that you would think a, a, a jazz musician would know, but he did know the, some things like Eric Dolphy tunes and, you know, so, so I don't think he would be somebody, and I might be wrong about this, but I wouldn't guess he's somebody that's versed in, you know, 20s and 30s music and, you know, the big band music of, of uh, the mid 20th century, you know, I, and even bebop for that matter, I think. I think his starting points later, and I can respect that because that's the reason he plays the way he plays. Interesting. I mean, that's that's the one thing I've learned is that there, there are there are some rules, but you know, the opinions are there's are wide. I mean, there's so many different ways to go about this. Let's talk about Pittsburgh for a moment. Yeah, I have this. When we started this project back in 1995, I remember someone saying, well, you should go interview Harold Betters, mm -hmm. the world's loudest trombone player. <laughs> I said, really, the world's loudest trombone player? He was a Pittsburgh thing. Uh, He's guy. still there. We just, we just had a, uh, a birthday celebration for him. Oh. Lots of the trombone players came out. Um, the guys from the symphony, local, you know, trombone players there, and there's Harold nine, in his 90s. Is yeah. he still playing? He's still playing. They just had Slide Hampton in Pittsburgh about a month ago, and there they had Harold Betters, um, 
and uh, Al Dow, another local uh, trombone player in Pittsburgh, who was one of the one of the first people that allowed me to come up and sit in and be receptive to us. We couldn't play, you know. We're I'm from Wheeling, West Virginia originally, so the big city to us was Pittsburgh. We would drive up, go to Al Dow's jam session, and then drive back to West Virginia, you know. And Al would let us on stage. He would, he would welcome us into the community. So. Um, but Harold, yeah, so they just had, uh, they had Slide there, and um, Peter Lynn, are you familiar with Peter Lynn, the trombonist? He um, plays trombone, he helps Slide, you know, Slide had a stroke not long ago, so, but, so he helped Slide with some things, some physical things, and, and also some musical things, so they brought them out to, uh, they brought him out to Pittsburgh uh, for the show, and he did some, a great interview of slide and herald this is just a month ago so you can find that online there's slide and herald talking about each other sitting next to each yeah, other yeah that's a you great know. thing to, to capture you know <laughs> and uh and herald said yeah i can't i can't uh i could never play fast like these guys so i just play melodies and slide said i couldn't play melodies so i just played fast yeah. <laughs> just to see the two of them sitting yeah. there is great that's terrific yeah most musicians, it seems, have a moment or that they figure, I have to go to New York. Yeah. Is that true for you? Yeah, it is in a way. It is in a way, but, you know, my, my first goal was to make a living playing music. Um, and so I got out of college when I, well, first of all, I was in college. I had a great mentor, a relatively unknown bassist and composer, Kevin Fryson. What's his last name? Fryson, okay. like David Fryson, no relation, but Kevin Fryson. And um, we were kind of in his camp. And he was serious, meaning a 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. rehearsal was not uncommon for us. So 90% of people that came through the door in his scene left immediately because it was, he was, he was too rough around the edges. Um, and it was just, it was too much of a commitment just work-wise and emotionally for a lot of people. Um, but so I stayed, I was drawn to him and he was, of course, he opened my mind up to everything, avant-garde, he had thousands of records. He was incredibly versatile on electric and upright bass. Um, so that was a real education. Then I left there to go work on cruise ships. Then I went to Pittsburgh. I, I, that, I grew tired of the ships. Inside of two years, I was, I was done. So I made a little money. I got out, learned a lot of standards during that time, which was good. Learned how to be punctual. And learned how to be punctual, learned how to front a band, learned how to learn a bunch of standards without the internet and real books or anything, you know. Let me... 90s. Okay, how did you learn them if you didn't have the internet? I'd have older guys show them to me. Because we, when we came onto the show, I remember the first ship I came onto in a quartet, the other band was guys that just, they knew a million tunes and they were 30, 40 years older than us. So they would be a resource. They might have a, a, they might have, you know, I remember that guy having a stack of real books. We didn't have that. He had a stack of real books. So that was one res resource. Um, but also you could just catch them after their set because I would figure things out and say, hey, what's the bridge to such and such? And then they would just show me, you know. Um, so I left that and I went back to Pittsburgh and started doing my thing there. And my idea was to go to New York. I had friends that were moving to New York. Um, but keep in mind, I'm from Wheeling, West Virginia. So I was thrilled to get that cruise ship gig. I, you know, I, there was a, a big possibility in my mind that I would never get out of West Virginia. So I, I got... When I, the thing that helped me to move to Pittsburgh was I got a gig with a cover band so I could move to Pittsburgh. And then I started to become on the jazz scene, Roger Humphreys, who's the great, he's like the godfather of jazz in Pittsburgh. He played with Horace Silver. He's an amazing drummer. So I, I'm getting just all this experience there. And then Maynard Ferguson 
would always have young guys in the band. And where they were from, it, it kind of moved like a wave. Like, so if, if you had a lot of guys, if there were guys in the band from North Texas, then they would recommend their buddies from North Texas. So there were some guys that got under the band from Pittsburgh. And that began a wave, and then I got recommended onto the band. And I subsequently recommended other people onto the band. So finally, I was involved in jazz. So Lee, going with Maynard in 1999, by a year later, I was musical director. And it was really worthwhile to me. I could write, I could play, I could meet other musicians, do record dates, go to New York. When, my experience in New York when I was with Maynard, I would go to New York and live there for a week and play the Blue Note, you know, or go into the studio. And that happened a lot. It was the same thing with London. We would go and play Ronnie Scott's for a week or two weeks, you know, in these different places. So, you know, and Seattle, Jazz Alley, Blues Alley, you know, all the different jazz clubs. So we'd go there for a week and, and we'd do it year after year. So that prevented me from moving to New York. Because you had the income, you, you had the gig, and you had I the had travel. a connection to jazz, you know. Um, and I thought it was good work. And it, it didn't pay that great. So there were a lot of m slightly more established musicians that wouldn't do that gig. It paid what? It didn't pay that great. Yeah. Was it a salary? Salary. So it didn't depend. If you only worked twice in a week, you were getting a salary. Which that never happened, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you got a small salary. And, but you know, they would give raises from time to time, depending on who was asking. And then also I had the, um, you know, Maynard wanted me to stay towards the end of my time with him. So I did a record, my first record. I was allowed to open the show for him, sell my CDs. Again, this is just slightly before the MP3 download thing got really big. So I was selling CDs after the show for $20 a CD. So, you know, by the end of my stay, I was actually doing pretty well with this band, which was thought of as a low paying job, you know. So. Maynard passed away in 2006. Well, let me say this again. Let's just rewind a little bit. I kind of halfway through that experience, um, a friend of mine said, one of the guys on Maynard's band said, hey, are you, you know what the uh, Thelonious Monk competition is? I said, no. He said, it's the Sheraton in trombone. I think you should audition. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, I think you have a shot. I'm thinking, me? You know, so I put together a tape and got accepted and then got to go to D.C. in this competition. That is when I really became aware of who, of what else existed out there, you know. Andre Hayward w won that competition. Um, I met, um, reconnected with Andre there, reconnected with Steve Davis. Um, Elliot Mason was a competitor. Marshall Gilks, all these great trombone players. And, and, and the judges, of course, uh, Gratia Moncur, Julian Priester, Steve Davis, Curtis Fuller, you, you know, so just, you know, and then of course Herbie Hancock is there, Wayne Shorter is there, all the Monk Institute people. So that, that was a time for me when I thought, wow, this is, now, now I'm getting a view of what's really going on. You know, I didn't feel like I belonged there at all, but um, that, that was the first sense I got for what was, what was happening. After Maynard died, um, two years after that, I got the call to go with Jason Mraz, and that was, you know, something I couldn't turn down. Yeah. Um, and that lasted a long time. And also, you know, New York, I, I kind of missed my opportunity. My father lived to be 92, and as he was aging, I thought, my, this is bad enough. I'm on the road. I want to go home and check on him. And, you know, I didn't want to disappear from the region completely. So just choices were made. And, and, uh, and you know, that, that time between 2006 and 2008, I would, you can ask my wife, I would go to New York once a month on the bus and sleep on my friend's couch, uh -huh. go to sessions, and hang out. It's always a, uh, a weaving path for musicians, and do you have an idea of what it means for yourself 
to make it in the music business? Well, you know, um, for, for me, making it is doing what you want and getting paid, not just getting paid. Not just doing what you want and not getting paid. So if you can, you know, because we can do that. I can do that to the end of time in my living room. Um, but yeah, being able to do the things that you enjoy and making a living from it. And you make, you make compromises and that's okay. That's what life is about, you know. Um, so, you know. I, I have some different things that I do, and, I, and, and over time you come to accept where the music is taking you, you know. If a junior high trombone player saw you play and then came up to you and said, I want to do what you do, and his father and mother were standing behind him, do you have um, advice for that student? Practice, practice, and stay in school. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had a student come to me when I played with Maynard Ferguson in Pittsburgh. Those were always great shows. And um, his name was Frank Cohen. He came, walked up to me and said, I would like to have lessons from you. I think he was in the 10th grade at the time. And he said, oh, I'd like to have lessons from you. And I said, great, let's do it. When I'm off the road, let's, let's get together. So we started getting together. And, you know, I don't see myself as like a teacher in the traditional sense. I'm a suggester. You know, I like to practice with my students, give them suggestions, give them different ways to think about things, and, and help them go through the process. But so we did this. He was coming to my house with his dad for lessons. And his advice, his question to me when he was getting ready to uh, graduate from high school was what now I'm going to I'm going to apply to Duquesne I'm going to um, Duquesne which is a university in Pittsburgh he was thinking about his options in the region I said Frank apply to all the best jazz schools on the east coast just see what happens he went to the Manhattan School of Music and got a master's degree and Frank has several Grammys now so my advice to him was move to New York. <laughs> and he did. And he's a talent. I mean, he's, he's doing all this great stuff. And um, I'm really proud to know him, and I'm glad I gave him that advice. Yeah. You know, not that he couldn't have had another path to happiness, but it was great to see him go there and succeed. And I thought, yeah, and like, you know, again, to your question of myself being in New York, I thought now's the time. If you can go to New York, you should go. And he did, and he did. He's done very well. Great. Yeah. Let's talk about composing. Mm. So if I commissioned you mm. to write a chart, let's say for a 10-piece band, mm -hmm. anything you wanted, mm -hmm. how would you approach that? How do you get started? Um, well, I have to get, I have, the starting point has to be, you know, if, if anything I want, then I would think, well, who am I? What do I really want? Uh, and the first thing would be the instrumentation. So if I could do whatever I want, it doesn't have to be a college big band. If it's a 10-piece band, it could be anything, right? It could be two drummers, mm -hmm. you know. It, uh, so I would, I would think a lot about the instrumentation. I would also think about some of the musical, um, the compositional ideas that I have that are kind of on deck to be um, set into, you know, something more complete. Because I have a lot of ideas, I think a lot of musicians do. S snippets, compositions, parts of compositions, movements of, you know, so I would, I would look at what I already have. I would think about something maybe something that's brand new, but the instrumentation, I think, is a good starting point. Mm -hmm. And where does the initial melodic idea, do you stumble across those things? Do you vocalize them? Do you sit at the piano? All of, all of the above. 
I get in the morning. I typically get these flashes of of tunes. They feel fresh. If they feel fresh, they're fresh. You know, maybe twelve hours later, you say, "Ah, oh, it's been done before." You know, but if it comes across and feels fresh, I'll record those little ideas, and I'll think about them and think about them and let, try to let them grow. You know, I have other songs. I have I have sections of songs where it's like it's like introducing. It's like playing matchmaker and introducing. Oh, so have you met? Have you met? The, you know, he's in the same key as you. Could you get along? Yeah, and yeah. you know he's twenty four bars. I know you're sixteen bars, but that's you know, clever. You guys would be really compatible <laughs> together. That's a good answer. So Jimmy Nepper, mm. it's nice that you paid attention to him like you did, because there's an awful lot of musicians in sort of that middle ground. Mm -hmm that as time goes by, you know, they don't get the recognition. So that was a very a passionate excursion for you. It was, it, it because how it started. Are you aware how this started? I read your little interview online. That, yeah. His daughter and my mother, his wife and daughter and my mother went to the same church. My mother still goes there, it's a Unitarian church. And um, yeah, so they were friends. My mother was good friends with Jimmy's, Jimmy's wife, widow. And but anyway, time moved on. She passed, but uh, Jimmy's daughter Robin was still there at the church with my mother, and and uh, my mother said it, it just kind of came together slowly. My mom said, "You know who Jimmy Nepper is? Yeah, of course, I know Jimmy Nepper from Charles Mingus." Harris' daughter goes here. She has some mouthpieces for you. She's wondering if you wanted them. And I reached out to her, kind of didn't hear back. And, um, and then my mother circled back a while later and said, hey, Robin's talking about maybe giving you Jimmy's horn. So I, um, I connected with Robin Jim, Jimmy Nepper died in Wheeling, West Virginia, where I'm from, because that's where Robin and her husband were living at the time. So when they had to leave Staten Island because they were getting old, you know, he, I think, eventually developed Parkinson's. Um, they cared for them in Wheeling, her mother and father. So that's how this all kind of came together. So when this is a few years ago, Robin decided she wanted to, it was time to pass along Jimmy's physical things. The horn meant a lot to her, even, because she associated so much with him. And she's just, a, just like this beautiful person. And um, when I went down there to see her as they're, they're getting ready to move and they're getting their place in order, getting it ready to sell, and I walk in, there's, there's like nine trombones and a trumpet and some other things on a bed and mouthpieces and mutes and all this stuff. She gave me the horn. She gave me several horns. And um, it was so profound. I share all this with my, uh, my good friend and collaborator, Matt Parker. He's a saxophonist from Brooklyn. And uh, so we started working on this tribute concert for Jimmy Nepper. And we just went in all the way to Jimmy Nepper. And we realized it was like even more than what we were aware of. Of course, we know about the Charles Mingus work, you know. And he's kind of framed in that world as like a copyist, you know. Uh, 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 but then again, he's also, if you dig a little deeper, you'll see that he's included as one of three of the most important contributors in Mingus's career. Danny Richmond, Eric Dolphy, and Jimmy Nepper. So we went and did this, this big concert. And uh, it was sold out. It was in Wheeling at the Stifle Fine Arts Center, and Robin was there. And it was really, that was all it was. It was, and we, and, and she, I'm just telling you the, the, the emotion, the love, and the feeling that's just around her. And I have a daughter. So I'm seeing this woman who's 20 years older than me. I'm seeing her as a little girl, you know? I'm seeing her as my daughter. And so all this experience is touching me on another level. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then after, um, after that happened, um, another a bass player from Pittsburgh who executive produces a lot of records, his name's Mark Perna, he showed some interest in supporting us for a record date. So then we were like, wow, we're gonna make a record. You know, so then we got to go even further into the Jimmy Never legacy, and then we got to share those compositions with the with the musicians on the date. They were just blown away by the heaviness and 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 you know the J Jimmy's uh, work. So it just the whole experience was unbelievable, and it was I was just caught in the way. You know. I had only known Jimmy as, um, I, did, I never had a Jimmy Nepper record, maybe one. I knew, I had all the Mingus stuff, and I'm a Mingus fanatic, so I had all the Mingus stuff, but I didn't, you know. So it brought me really close to his, him as an artist. Terrific. Yeah. When you do a record date like that, mm -hmm. how, off, how much time do you get in the studio? It, it, it depends on your funding. Yeah. It depends on your funding, so that, um, I did two days. Every, everything for that was preparation, getting the charts in order, rehearsing, and then going into the studio, kind of a pricey studio, you know, in, in Brooklyn. So um, we were two days in the studio. And that was enough, mm -hmm. you know. Does it take a while to get used to um, the fact that there's some separation in the studio, the drummer may be behind a glass house or whatever. It does. And you got headphones and... It does. Diff it does. In that studio, although we could had we could have been completely separated, we um, purpose purposely didn't do that. So like the bass player was in the booth, but the door was open and he was kind of out. Piano was out in the open. Horns are facing piano and drums. Maybe he had a, the drums had a little bit of soundproof, but we're all looking at each other right here, you know. So it was somewhat live, you know. Is everybody involved, all the players, are they all involved in the choosing of the best take? Yes. Well, people can weigh in. Okay. But when the session is over, you still have two or three takes of each tune that, you know, the, the buck stops. We were producing the record, so we had to eventually... Right. Make that choice. Yeah. So we had a lot of material to go through, and there's a lot we didn't use. You know, because we probably recorded 15, mm. 16 songs. Wow. Several That's takes. A lot. Uh, and we wanted to go, you know, with, for a long list of reasons, you pick what you pick. You know? Yeah. I mentioned earlier, uh, you're, you went into trad jazz mm -hmm. clubs and so forth. If uh, you could do time travel, would you go back to a certain era to witness particular jazz events? Mm, that's a good question. I think I would go ahead and do the 1959 thing. You know. Yeah, I just read something about 1959. Yeah, 1959 is big. I think I would probably do 1959. Just drop me off in New York and just let me, I'll figure it out, you know. Yeah. You sometimes wonder did those musicians have a sense that what they were doing on these particular sessions or playing in these particular venues was historical? Was I think they did. Yeah. I think they did. Because if you look at some of those old clips of shows where they're introducing, you know, of course, you know, the musicians were celebrated to a certain extent, you know. Um, on, on another hand, of course, horrible discrimination and, and whatnot was going on in our country. But artistically, they were being validated not only by their peers, but by the media and by listeners in other countries. You know, and if you were a jazz musician in the 50s and you went to Europe, you would feel that sense of appreciation, you know, um, that maybe you weren't getting in the United States. But I think, I think a lot of them knew, you know. You see, you know, 
Duke Ellington lived long enough to understand, you know, that he was not just a successful band leader and composer, arranger, but celebrated as a national treasure. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of the things that are, were said about Duke Ellington were said while he was alive. You know, greatest American composer of all time, that kind of stuff. They, right. Some of them knew, you know. I've seen many times the phrase, Jazz is the, America's only original art form. Mm -hmm. And I sort of agree, but then I think, well, what about the blues? And if we're calling rock and roll art now, it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's wonderful that so many forms of music started here and then got spread around the world. Yeah. Um. Terms are tossed around quite loosely, you know, artist is a loose, there's a loose definition to that. And the African American experience is so um, unto its own that it, you know, this experience in this country created everything you're talking about, blues, Rock and roll, jazz is all part of the same experience. Um, but I know what you mean. They make the dis distinction that jazz is an art, the art form, the only true American art form, because blues and rock and roll and the other things are thought of as popular music. And jazz is thought of more as an art music. But jazz was popular music when it, it was. started. It right? certainly was. Yeah. And I, you know, the categories, don't, you know, and rock and roll has broken all the, the boundaries and definitions and borders as well. I mean, have you heard, you know, there's so many sub genres in rock and roll and there's some incredible things that have happened. You know, I, I don't know a jazz musician that doesn't respect the work of Zappa. You know, you know, I love Bjork. Now what is that music, you know? Um, but yeah, jazz as an art form, I mean, I, I hear it all the time too. I don't know if it's, I don't know how true that is. I don't know how you define, you know, art, but yeah, I hear that, I hear that quite a bit. Yeah. Um, you're playing tonight in this space. Mm. You're playing with a musician you know really well. Mm -hmm. You're also playing with musicians that I don't think you've met. And this is not uncommon in the jazz world. Sometimes you get a gig, then you get a band. But sometimes people are mystified by that. If someone who really likes jazz but doesn't understand how that's possible, mm. they say, how does that work? How, how does jazz work like that? Mm -hmm. Can you respond to them? I think, I think it's good to compare it to the rules of a conversation and a language. As you and I are here having a conversation, there's a certain, um, we've learned, we met today, and we've been learning to speak our entire lives, this language, so that we can have a conversation. We can have a deep and meaningful conversation, and it's like that in jazz. There's nouns and verbs, pronouns, I mean, there's, there's sentence structure. So there's a language, it's a broad language as is a spoken language. Um, so that would be my best way to make a non-musician understand what's going on there. Mm -hmm. There's things that are unsaid because we've all studied the language. Right. You know, and it has to start somewhere. My four-year-old son is learning to write his name. And that's going to turn into him having, a, hopefully, one day, a mastery of the language. So, Has he learned the word gig yet? Oh, yeah. He knows when dad's putting on his gig shoes, you know? My father was a minister, so it was church shoes, you know? But now, for me, it's gig shoes, you know? But, um, yeah, so there's a language there. Now, when you have, when you have deeper relationships, you know, you 
you can have more intimate, meaningful mm -hmm. conversations. Of course, I think the relationships are invaluable. We talk about bands and you know regular relationships between people. Um, that time accounts for a lot. So I can have a great conversation with you, but it's not the same conversation that I could have with my, my mother, you know, or somebody that I know more. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's interesting to see what will happen. I've got, you know, Mike, Mike and I were on the road, Mike DeBanowitz and I were on the road with Maynard for okay. years. And then Orrin and I are close, but The other guys, we'll see how it goes. We'll yeah. speak the language. And sometimes when there's a potential train wreck in the music, it recovers nicely and it becomes like a, a yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mistakes are good. Mistakes are good. Yeah. You played, I don't know how long for, but you played with one of my favorite bands with Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Mm -hmm. It's been about a year. Yeah. How did you learn that music? Did they have the charts and all they that? They sent me the charts. Yeah. Were you expected to memorize them? I was expected to get a grasp on them. Yeah. And be ready for the gig. Um, some of the other guys had sheet music on music stands. I, a lot of, in a lot of situations, will put music onto my iPad. Yeah. So, and with, with <laughs> this software, where it's, it's for reading music off of an iPad. So I did a lot of listening, looking through the parts. You know. Was that with David Clayton Thomas, or was that no? He was no, this, not in the this group is just a, This is just this is like a, around a year ago. Oh, okay. So I was um, subbing onto that band. Um, I don't know if I did eight or eight or ten gigs with them, and, and the musical director at the time was my old friend from Maynard's band, Carl Fisher, who is now a featured trumpet player with Billy Joel. So. Um, he left his position of blood, sweat, and tears, and and you know he's got plenty to do with Billy Joel and other things. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So that was, you know, I appreciate, I really appreciate those kind of experiences. You know. Like with uh, postmodern jukebox. Yeah. Going on tour with them. Yeah. This on on this and off tour. Yeah. 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 Speaking of trad bands. Yes. What's their thing? New music, old style. New they, music, vintage style. Vintage style. So they've got that down. Yeah. That's a good niche these days. Seems to be a good niche. That's their niche. Yeah. And people really respond to it. I saw Branford, and I was talking to him. I, and I, I fr a friend, we have a mutual friend, Chris Hemingway, who we, I was on the road with, with Postmodern Jukebox. And I said, hey, I just got off the road with Chris Hemingway. He said, oh, Postmodern Jukebox, I love that band. I didn't expect for him to say that. Yeah. You know. Okay. Um, let's wrap up with uh, yeah. what do you think of jazz education, the state of jazz education? Do you have an opinion on? Um, I think it's good because there's always a new crop of young people that are willing to commit them to commit to the journey. Mm -hmm. So, and they're looking for to be educated not just in institutions, but in the experience of having mentors and real life, you know, experience, gigs. Uh, that's where you, you really learn, you know, and, and you learn a lot in school as well. And I think it's great when I think of people like Sean Jones, you know, um, now going to Peabody and and I hear the young people playing, it's very good, you know? So I think, it, I think we're, we're in a great space. I don't, you know, I don't like to, you know, I don't like to demonize, you know, everything has its place. I, the school, the thing is structure of school, you can, there's a lot to be, you know, learned there. But as a player, um, Having that experience on, as either a fly on the wall, or if you can actually make it onto the bandstand, that those being there for yeah. the to see the real thing is 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 the most important as a player. I think. Right. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing you tonight. Thank you. And best of luck with your tours and your your 
trombone and your children and your family. Thank you very much. All right. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank Thanks you. a lot.